We show onboard computer synchronization. Now entering the nexus of geekery and guy world. In three, two, one, mark. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? This is the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. A service of Shark Flight Publishing. Hey kids, welcome back for episode 9 of the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. I'm your host as always, Ian J. Malone. And uh, you know the usual spiel by now, you can find us all over the place. We're online at dudesinhyperspace.com. We also do the social media thing via the Facebook and Twitter machines at the HyperDudes. We'll get you to either one of our profiles, so we love hearing from you guys. Find us that way. You can also email us at dudesinhyperspace at gmail.com. Lots of stuff in the news lately to talk about, from Star Wars to Smallville, of all things. We're going to get to that later on in the evening. But uh, first, Dave. I should introduce you. How are you doing, my friend? Who is this Dave guy? Was he on last week? <laughs> I, I, I do your thing, man. I'm 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 a professional. I claim to be, but apparently I'm just trashing it this evening. So save me. Somebody <laughs> save me. Sorry. Oh sorry. no, I'm no. Still in do Smallville. not. Do still not sing. Do not man. sing. Yep. Hey, uh, you know, I I knew I knew tonight that Scott would not be on. I knew it. After the last podcast I was on, I knew Scott would not be on. Tonight is the premiere of The Good Place, so of course he has better things to do. Uh, well, that was not the excuse I got. I got that Scott is on the IR tonight with a bad voice. So uh, he's in the bullpen rehabbing. He'll uh, make it through a rehab start somewhere along the way before he comes back up to the big time. But tonight he's playing hurt, so he's hanging home. Now that's nothing a little whiskey can't fix. Uh, that is the rumor. So, all right, well, we've been teasing this stuff on social media uh, the last couple of days, last couple of weeks, really. Pro wrestling, it is a thing. It has not always been a thing, but of late, it's really been a thing because there's lots of news going on. Uh, Lots of news that old school fans like me and Dave have waited quite a few years to hear, and it starts with the word competition. Uh, World Wrestling Entertainment, All Elite Wrestling. It would appear that we have a new war on our hands, ladies and gentlemen, for pro wrestling dominance in the marketplace. And that, friends, is a very, very good thing. But we didn't feel content to uh, just talk about it as a couple of old farts who grew up back in the day watching wrestling. We figured probably best we reach out into the industry, see if we could bring in somebody who uh, could help us talk about it, that knows, obviously, the old school stuff because they grew up in it like we did, but they're also plugged into pro wrestling in the here and now. So without further ado, I introduce tonight's guest, Mr. Raj Geary of WrestlingInc.com. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. How are you guys doing today? Not too bad, man. Thanks for coming on board. So tell me a little bit about yourself, man. I mean, this is kind of a two-parter to kick this off. How did you get into wrestling? Did you grow up with it like we did? How were you introduced to it? Where did you fall in love with it? And then obviously, you became the Uber fan and took it to a whole new level by making it your career. You're now a journalist. You're the president of WrestlingInc.com. Um, you know, it's a big site with a huge followership. It's known throughout the industry. So how did all of that come to be? Well, I was, I started as a wrestling fan back in the 80s, uh, you know, with Hulk Hogan, the Macho Man, uh, 1987 WrestleMania 3. That was kind of when I got into it. I watched it at a buddy's house and and I've been ever into it ever since. Um, it, but yeah, the, the characters and, and the, uh, the wrestlers that you had back in the day, they were so large in life and just so interesting. Like someone like the Macho Man, you 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 will never meet anyone that reminds you of Randy Savage, right? Sure. He's a totally one in a million uh, character. So, yeah, I just got sucked in, and you know, I was starting to lose interest there a little bit in the uh, in the early '90s when I went to college. Uh, you know, WWF at that time they. Uh, they were hurting. Uh, their storylines had, you know, gotten pretty bad. The, the the characters were all, you know, like you know, trash men and things like that. And then, you know, once WCW, uh, once Monday Nitro started going head to head with Raw, I got back into it, and uh, yeah, been watching ever since. Nice. So now, what caused you to turn the page and make this a professional thing where you're actually covering it? I mean, WrestlingInc.com, man, it's a big time website. For folks who don't know what that is, get into the know and go check them out now. But how did that come to be? You know, actually, it started out as uh, I just wanted to learn how to make web pages. I was in engineering school and I was hating it. I I was uh, in school to be a chemical engineer. And just one weekend, my and now wife, then girlfriend, was out of town. I was like, I'm just going to learn how to make a web page. And I was a wrestling fan, so uh, that was my topic. And so it was never meant to be uh, 
it was never meant to be my career. It was always just meant to be a way to learn this skill that I could use, uh, you know, outside of college. And then, you know, once I, I remember the first day I got like 12 hits and right. that was such a big deal to me. I was like, wow, this, you know, people I don't know are checking out my stuff. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just kept at it, started talking to a lot of guys and, and yeah, here, here we are 22 years later. So I started it back in 97. Wow. 22 years, man. That is a sweet gig. Back to wrestling. I kind of want to start macro with this discussion. You know, there's a lot of people out there like myself and like Dave who grew up loving pro wrestling. Uh, You know, Dave and I, I have such fond memories of AJ Sports Bar in Tallahassee, Florida in the late 1990s. You know, he was working for the local television station. I was at school at Florida State doing communications work. And, you know, this is at a time before uh, you, you really have a whole lot happening on the Internet in terms of community building. There were no social networks. I mean, at best, you had a chat room on AOL. That was what you had back then. And so when you wanted to get together with the community to watch something like wrestling, you went to the sports bar on pay-per-view night. And it was awesome because you'd pack out 400, you know, 400 people in that place. And if the pay-per-view started at 7, 8 o'clock at night, you'd better be there by 3 to get a table. And everybody's there. Everybody's jacked. They're wearing rock T-shirts and Stone Cold Steve Austin jorts and boas. And they're running around with replica belts. And there's beer and food everywhere. And we all chant to the screens. That was the heyday when we all loved wrestling. And then, you know, our generation kind of faded out not too terribly long after that. But that really seems to be changing right now. A lot of people have made a go of it since WCW folded in the early 2000s. Uh, Some with modest success, but that's about the best you could say. In walks All Elite Wrestling. This is a, a group with a lot of money behind them. That's the first time you've really been able to say that. Uh, they seem to have a plan. They have a formula for a product. Um, and they, they really seem poised to actually generate some competition for the WWE. And then on the flip side of that coin, WWE is about to make the jump to network television on Fox on Friday night starting next week. So there's lots of new happening in pro wrestling right now. From the fans' perspective, we can get on Twitter all day long and look at this stuff. But you're on the inside. You cover this from an industry standpoint what is the vibe like in the industry? Are people as jacked up to see where this is headed as the fans seem to be? Oh, absolutely. I think next week is going to be, you know, just one of the most uh, fascinating uh, weeks in, in pro wrestling history. Uh, just, you know, with AEW debuting, we have no idea what that's going to look like. I mean, you can kind of go off their pay-per-views, but, you know, as far as a weekly TV show, uh, you know, there's a, it's just a lot of uh, questions and uh, a lot of things that we don't know. Um, you know, like how much of that fan, fan base that they have, uh, how big is it really? Is it just a, a small, passionate core that they'll sell out the arenas, but it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna set the TV world on fire as far as ratings go. So, um, yeah, a lot of intangibles, a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, you know interesting stories that are gonna come out of next week, and and same thing with the uh, WWE on Fox, you know. Moving to Fox now, you're you're with the big boys, and uh, you know you're you're being mentioned with football and, and baseball. So um, you know tr- having to bring in that audience because WWE they don't want to see their ratings drop, and that becomes the story because it's it'll it'll be it'll be a much wider story with them on Fox. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting time. As you look at what's been going on with with the WWE and everything that they've got, I mean they're obviously the king. How is AEW going to be different from what we've seen already that's come through? How are they going to, to generate enough interest to actually pull outside of that arena market? Yeah, so well, a lot of the changes that have happened in wrestling over like the last 15, 20 years, um, like scripted promos, like, you know, all the wrestlers now, they read from a script and they're not really given much leeway to, uh, to ad lib with, with some exceptions, but for the most part, that's how it works. Um, so AEW, they're getting rid of that. You know, they're, they're not going to have scripted promos. So, you know, when you have writers writing for wrestlers, you, you, only get, uh, you only get so many voices out there. And, you know, now each wrestler has their own voice. So um, that's going to be a big change. Uh, the matches should be faster paced than what you usually see on Raw and SmackDown. But, um, yeah, to that point, it'll be interesting to see how many wrestling fans are out there. And um, because... 
every time I've seen a popularity boom, it's always been with characters and, and the larger in life personalities, not the wrestling. The wrestling has always been secondary. I still believe that to be the case. So we'll see if AEW, they focus a lot more on that as well, because I think that's that's how you get people interested. I actually want to stay on AEW for just a second. There's been a lot of talk that their product, and you'll have to forgive my ignorance on this because I have not had a chance to check out their pay-per-views, but from what I understand, AEW is bringing something of a different product to the table with with their promotion. Um, I heard one person say that, to some degree anyhow, they want to put a little bit more of the sports back in sports entertainment. Um, part of that is measurables. Uh, they're going to bring some sort of stats to the table um, to kind of you know, give a little bit more authenticity to that sports element of their brand. I presume you've had a chance to check out the pay-per-views. When people tune into AEW Dynamite next Wednesday night, what are they going to see? I mean, how is it this brand of wrestling going to be different from what we've all grown up with in that regard? Well, yeah, to your point with the things with the stats and everything, they have talked about it, but so far they haven't really utilized it you know, okay. on their pay-per-views. I mean, they'll mention uh, wrestlers' wins and losses. Uh, they want to make those kind of things matter because if it doesn't matter who wins the match, then what's the point of even watching? You know? Sure. Uh, so th- I know they're trying to bring importance back to that, importance back to the titles, make it yeah a little more sports oriented, a little more adult than uh, the product that we've you know the WWE product that we've been seeing for the last since they went PG, and um, yeah, and, and uh, so it's it. If you watch one of their pay-per-views and you watch a WWE pay-per-view, it's it's not as glossy. It, it doesn't feel as... Uh, uh, like watching WWE, it sometimes it feels like you're watching a video game with just with the lights and lasers sure. and you know everything everywhere. And it's this is a little more... Uh, a more organic feel, a little grittier. Um, and I, I, I'm assuming it's going to continue that way on TV. What do you feel like, though? I mean, looking at that part of it, what do you feel like has to happen for... Uh, for, to, to borrow a phrase from World War II, to awake the sleeping giant that is the WWE, to get them back into a competitive mode? Well, they they already have, so I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with their developmental brand, NXT. Yep. Uh, so that used to air on the WWE Network, and now they're putting it head-to-head with AEW. So they already did two weeks, and then next week it's going to be uh, two hours head-to-head with AEW. That's and, on FS1, uh, correct? Uh, it's on USA Network. USA Network, okay. Yeah. And it's going to be live every week. Um, the The first two weeks, it did like 1.1 million viewers. This last week, it did a, a little over a million. Uh, so the viewership has dropped since last week. So we'll we'll see. You know, right now there's just so much wrestling product, and you know, at some point, it it just gets to be too much, and you get the the point of diminishing returns. So, you know, they the, they are putting another show up against AEW then they got their own raw three hours on Monday nights they got Smackdown now on Friday nights uh, impact wrestling they're gonna be on Tuesday nights uh, so it's pretty you know pretty much every night of the week you got wrestling impact is still kicking around out there good. it's still kicking around good, good for the <laughs> good for those little guys <laughs> that's not condescending at all sorry guys uh, all right well listen sticking with the wwe and you actually just touched upon this which is beautiful in radio land we used to call that a segue i love those um the state of wwe you've talked a bit about how they're rolling with the punches now with aew on the scene they're changing a bit of what they do obviously they're changing their you know their lineup with how they bring their product to television uh, you know, what other changes can we expect from WWE? I mean, will, will SmackDown look differently on Fox than it has, um, you know, in its, in its previous cable home? Uh, you know, I've heard talk that maybe WWE would consider cutting Raw back to two hours, which I think is a great idea. Uh, you know, are they going to shift their roster? I mean, what other kind of changes can we expect from WWE to now keep up in the new war? So a lot of it is, um, you know, changes on the surface that, you know, really aren't going to matter too much in the long run. They are, you know, they're going to do, they're trying out new camera angles, uh, new cameras that they're going to be using for SmackDown. It is going to have a different look. Um, probably not, you know, ultimately their stage is going to look similar to what you've seen before, just, you know, new graphics and things like that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, the, uh, Raw, they're not going back to two hours anytime soon. Uh, their deal with the USA Network, which kicks in, uh, I think next month as well. Uh, that's the first of their five-year deal. So it's it's three hours on USA Network uh, for the next five years, and yeah, it, three hours is just way too much. Um, and 
you know, and the, but the amount that they're getting in television rights fees, it makes it difficult to, to change that. So, uh, but ultimately, it's also hurting the product and, and driving viewers away. I mean, once they moved to three hours, you saw the, the decline in popularity uh, sure. speed up a lot. So. Well, and I mean, you're seeing this, and it, it really surprises me that WWE isn't a little bit more forward thinking. That goes against everything we know about WWE. Um, you know, when you look around professional sport right now, it seems like that is the big theme that a lot of people are pushing for. How do we get shorter? You know, the new millennial generation of fans, they don't want three and a half, four hour football games. They want two and a half hour football games. I mean, the XFL is going to roll out in the spring and that's one of their marching cries. We're going to have short games, 25 second play clocks. It's go, 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 go and out. Um, you know, Major League Baseball is struggling with this right now. Their games are too long. They're looking at pitching, uh, pitching clocks and stuff like that to try and tighten up the, you know, tighten up what's happening on the screen so that there's more action all the time. And it really surprises me that, that WWE is not entertaining that. Uh, it would seem like that's very much a trend right now in sport. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Vince, you know, you've heard him talk about that, like you mentioned with the XFL. Like Vince talked about how football games are too long, but then you got Raw, you know, that's three hours every Monday. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just it's all about the bottom line. They're making more money than they ever have. So while wrestling is probably the least popular uh, it's been in my lifetime, they are making the m most money that they've ever made. And these television rights deals, that's a half a billion dollars a year that they're making off of those sure. between Fox and USA. So yeah, it, it's just, it's taking the money now, even though you're hurting your business in the long term. Right. Well, and I mean, I would presume there's some sort of a, a clause in there where if ratings fell off too far, USA would probably go to them and say, listen, guys, you know, we're all in this together. We, we need to, we need to look at the formula here because we're not making the money off of it. And if, if cutting this to two hours means we can come in more advertising revenue. Maybe that's something we should look at. Anyway, television drives the train in all sports. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that wrestling is the same way. Yeah. And USA network, they didn't, haven't really had any hits lately. So they're more dependent on WWE than, than ever. So they want more WWE content because that X, that third hour ride raises their average rating for the station. So it's, right. it's a big and deal for them. They are a far cry from the burn notice days. That is to be <laughs> right. sure. Right. So, well, let's let's kind of get out of the out of the business element of this a, a little bit and shift gears to kind of the the part of wrestling that we all fell in love with, and that's star power. You know, for years and and still now, really, the stars of wrestling are what drive the train. And pick your era. You know, you can talk about Hogan, you can talk about Flair, you can talk about Sting, you can talk about Austin versus The Rock and Triple H and DX. You can talk about John Cena or Daniel Bryan or whomever. You know, with you kind of being on the inside and knowing what these guys' persona is today on camera and also having dealt with them off camera so you get to know them as legitimate human beings, if you could start your own promotion tomorrow, President Raj, you're in charge. Who are the three superstars on either of the major rosters that you would want to take with you to be able to launch a new brand, and why? Huh, that's a uh, only three. Well, do, does Brock Lesnar count? Because he's uh, uh, he's part time, so yeah. he's not he's not a full time the guy. Mercenary wrestler. <laughs> um, uh, you know what? I'd probably I'd probably take uh, Chris Jericho. Okay. Uh, Kenny Omega, and uh, maybe Roman Reigns, I guess. Um, yeah, if I had to pick three, it'd probably it'd probably be those because they have the star power more than uh, most people right now. Why is it that there seem to be so few stars now? Well, I think a lot of it, a lot of the shift in wrestling has gone to the action, like the the ring work, I guess you could say, and so like a lot of the hardcore fans they don't care about the characters as much now as they do the, the wrestling, you know, the actual in ring. And I think that's hurt it because, you know, you want to get casual fans, you, you know, it's the star power, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get talk someone into going to see Creed by telling them that the, the fight at the end is great. You know, it's the story and, and the characters. Um, and I think that's, that, it's been missing for a while, and um, and once in a while, you got Bray Wyatt, who kind of created this new character recently, and it's the hottest thing, and so it shows when you can do it something successfully, um, you know, it still works. Well, I mean, it seems like anytime I hear people, in North Carolina, there's tons of wrestling roots down here, 
uh, you know, Jim Cornette's down here and a bunch of people. And I actually heard Cornette interviewed on uh, one of the regional sports talk shows down here, and they got into the subject of modern day pro wrestling. And actually, I heard Steve Austin on the Dale Earnhardt Jr. podcast kind of echo the same sentiment. And that is that, he, and they both said when when guys come in now to the the factory, if you will, they're pretty well evaluated like a piece of meat and told, okay, here's the persona that you're going to play. And back in the day, that was not the case. It was, let's get to know the individual, what's their personality, and then let's build a persona around that. I mean, anybody who knows Dwayne Johnson from the University of Miami or wherever will tell you, I mean, The Rock is just a souped-up, amped-up version of Dwayne Johnson times 11. And we saw what that did, and I, I don't understand why the writers of, of WWE don't still adhere to that formula. Well, there is a... Uh... There is a conspiracy conspiracy theory that WWE doesn't want their talent to become too big anymore. Like they they don't want anyone bigger than the brand. So uh, a lot of times you'll see guys who are starting to pick up a ton of steam, steam, and then they just cool off on them completely. Like they'll have them just start losing uh, quickly, and and uh, it just goes against anything you you know as a TV show uh, you'd want. Uh, you know, your characters that are, you know, developing a following, you'd want to push that and, you know, uh, focus on them. But you've kind of seen the you've seen the opposite, more or less. Uh, how much of that do you think, though, is, is, is stemming from them just kind of being afraid they're going to lose them? Like someone's going to walk in with more money than they're willing to pay them and, and try to get them to be a competitor? Well, before, I don't think it was that much because they just have so much more money than anyone else that, you know, they could just pay for any talent. Um it, it, I think they were more concerned about people leaving to go off to like Hollywood, like Batista did, and uh, and they want they want their talent to feel like they need WWE, you know, and uh, that there's nowhere else to go. Now that there is, uh, it'll be interesting to see how if they change the way they push their talent. But so far, it hasn't happened. Who are some of the young stars that maybe people haven't heard of that we ought to be looking out for in the coming weeks and months and years? Uh, Bray Wyatt's kind of doing this gimmick right now that's gotten really over that and that, that's kind of like the the hottest thing in wrestling right now um kenny omega he's not he, he's been he's been around for a while but i think now that the fans that will get to see him on a you know national basis you know that's i think that'll be interesting um i'm trying to think oh, who else also in nxt adam cole uh, he, he's kind of what we were talking about as far as having that charisma and, and star power. And he has that. He's not the biggest guy, which I could see hurting him in WWE, but uh, he's got a he's got a ton of charisma. Those are, would be some of the biggest ones right now as far as talent that people probably do not know. Right. Seems like when I flip on Raw lately, there seems to be a big push toward recognizable names as well. Uh, that you know, listen, pushing family traditions—that's nothing new in wrestling. That's that's as you know, that's as old as the planet itself. But uh, and again, you know, I don't tune into Raw week in and week out and and watch it with a microscope. So maybe I'm a little off base on that. But it seems like you know, pushing the snookas and the flares and the you know the people of that ilk, uh, you know, over in AEW, obviously you've got Cody Rhodes and Dustin Rhodes that are leading the charge for for that promotion. Uh, but it seems like maybe now a little bit more than than recently, that seems to be the case that we're really trying to to kind of uh, bring the echoes of the past back up with this new generation of wrestlers with familiar family names. Do you do you get that as well, or am I off base on that? Um, I mean, it is easier, you know, for a, you know second third generation wrestler to get in, uh, but you know a lot of times they'll change their names to get rid of the family name. You know, Charlotte Flair, Charlotte Flair, uh, her her name's real name's Ashley Flair. But when they first brought her up, she was just called Charlotte. And, you know, they mentioned that she was Ric Flair's daughter, but they took the flair out um, and then and ended up adding it later. Uh, there's Bray Wyatt. He's a uh, he's third generation. They don't mention that at all. Uh, you know, his his roots uh, and who his parents are. So, um, yeah, it really depends. You know, he, he, The Rock, he, you know, his daughter has shown interest in getting into the wrestling business. And I'm sure they won't change her name. But right, uh, sure. But, uh, you know, some of the others, they have been, yeah. You know, speaking of some of these, these newer guys that, from, you know, that we watched in the 90s and 2000s, I saw a story uh, about Chris Benoit's son, who's a little young to get started actually wrestling on TV, but is, is talking about maybe going in and is interested in joining AEW. What's, uh, what's your thoughts on that and how that's going to play out with what happened with his dad? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a tough one, right? David Benoit, he's, uh, he's a great guy. I met him, I've met him before, and... Uh, Everyone that knows him, you know, really likes him. So it's terrible that the actions of someone else are hurting him. But um, 
yeah, it, it becomes a dicey one. But he was one that I would expect to probably go through a name change uh, if he signed with an AEW. But I, I don't think they'd completely hide the, the fact that he is, you know, Chris Benoit's son either. I, I, I don't think you can. Right. We can't touch on wrestling superstars and particularly free agents and who are they and where are they going without touching on the elephant in the room, and that is CM Punk. Everybody wants to know when and if this guy is going to come back. And if he does, has he mended fences with WWE to a place where Vince and and Hunter would let him back in? Or would AEW go all out to try and sign this guy? I know there was a tease about it whenever they had their pay-per-view in Chicago back in August. But what is the word underground, if you will, as to what's going on with CM Punk? So CM Punk, uh, he actually did a a panel in August, and he seemed a lot more... um, open to a WWE return than, than I would have expected because, uh, you know, it got really hairy with, with them, uh, with the lawsuit that, that ensued. And, and uh, yeah, the, the way they served his, his, you know, termination papers, he, you know, was clearly upset by that. So, yeah, I was kind of surprised that uh, that he seemed more um, open, I guess, to, to working there again. Um, and, you know, with AEW, he, he's talked openly about how they've been uh, trying to sign him and he he kind of made fun of them sending him a contract by text. I did see that on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think the AEW folks were too happy about that, but (laughs) you know, I, I I think if, if you don't see him next week, I don't see, I don't think he's returning to pro wrestling again. Really? Next week. Yeah. I think that, or, or this in October, um, I think, you would want him at the beginning, right? You you want that audience to to build. So I think if, if I'm AEW, I want him on that first show and kind of set the uh, set the tone. Do they have their marquee pay per view lined up yet? I mean, if they do, they have any idea what their answer to WrestleMania is going to be? Because it would seem like that would be an ideal time to bring a guy of Punk's caliber out. So uh, they are, they do a fall one. Uh, they're doing one in November. Uh, they just had one called All Out. And that's kind of their signature one. So that's over uh, Memorial Day weekend. I mean, Labor Day weekend. They also do one on Memorial Day weekend. So those are, I think those are their, the biggest shows that they're treating it almost like a tradition. Every year they're going to do All Out in Chicago. Uh, every year they're going to do the Memorial Day pay-per-view in Vegas, I think. So, uh, yeah, they, yeah they, they haven't really come up with a, a name that's, a, a, you know, that sticks as well as like a WrestleMania. But... Um, but yes, so they do have a couple of, of, of signature events. All right, so note to wrestling fans, keep an eye on wrestling in October. If it's going to happen, that's probably the time. Good to know. As we, uh, we start to float out. I mean, obviously, uh, with you running WrestlingInc.com, you guys are all about headlines, everything that you've got going on, uh, making sure everybody's informed. So what do you think are the, uh, the biggest headlines so far of 2019, and what kind of rumors are floating around right now that, uh, that you're willing to give us? Um, well, AEW, is, uh, that's been the biggest one, uh, you know, in this new Wednesday Night War that we're going to have. I mean, that has just changed everything for, for everyone, um, for all the wrestlers. And now they're getting, there's all this talent in WWE that they're getting paid a ton of money, like raises, uh, to not just so they don't go to AEW and they're not even using them. Um, so that so that's been that's been gigantic, and then obviously WWE moving to Fox, and you know we're we're gonna have to see where all that ends up. The XFL is a big story coming up. Uh, just how much bandwidth that takes from Vince McMahon, and how that will affect the wrestling product, or will it affect it for the better? If Vince, you know, you, you don't have this seventy year old man, you know, in charge of creative, and you know, kind of letting the reins loose a little bit. Stay so, tuned to us on the XFL. We've uh, we've got some stuff brewing on the XFL front that could be fun. So okay. uh, yeah, keep us around for that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, you had the uh, oh, God. I'm already forgetting the name of the, the other football league that that lasted what, like six weeks earlier this year. The A uh, the American Al- Alliance AAF. for Football. Yeah, AAFL is all I remember. Which yeah, was a, yeah. Was a ungodly wieldly acronym, a wieldy acronym, but you know whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Nice you mean work the, on the, that poor, one, the, marketing guy. The poor guy that had to gra- uh, bag groceries uh, right before he went out to the field so he could make more money? <laughs> yeah. And um, so, you know, just going by that, we'll have to see with the XFL. I think we've seen that people 
kind of done with football after after the Super Bowl. Right. It's going to be fun. Fun times indeed. All right, man. Well, listen, Raj Geary, uh, WrestlingInc.com. Uh, man, we really appreciate you coming on. Real quick, is there anything going on with your site that folks ought to know about? Any cool stories coming out that folks need to keep an eye out for? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, we always have a ton of interviews every week. Uh, we just got one with Rocky Johnson today, uh, the Rock's father. Uh, so th- that should be up on the site shortly. And uh, yeah, he talks about you know, helping his son enter the business and the stuff he had to go through uh, in the wrestling business as an African-American, you know, in the in the 60s in wrestling. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of a lot of really cool, fascinating stuff. All right. And you're obviously online at WrestlingInc.com. How about social media? Where can folks find you? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at RogeGary303. And, uh, yeah, WrestlingInc.com. Follow our Twitter or Instagram. Everything is at WrestlingInc. All right. Rock on, rock on. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. It was an absolute treat talking with you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. All right. Nice guy. Really, really nice guy. We can, he's welcome to come back anytime and chat. So, all right. Well, while it's just you and me, Dave, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of get back to it here with just the two of us before we break into the news. Uh, big week in wrestling next week, man. What do you want to see out of it? You know, I, the honest answer is is it just needs to be competition. Something that makes me want to watch more than the five or ten minutes that I turn it on every now and again and go, yeah, okay, same old stuff, let me keep going. Just something that grabs my attention. You know, I, that was back in the day, yeah, there were some moments that were not great when we used to watch it, but and it got a little weird. Uh, I remember uh, uh, May giving birth to a hand in the middle of Raw. That was a little much. But, you know, as... as as a fan, to get back into it, there's just got to be something that grabs my attention and keeps it for longer than just a few minutes. Yep. No, I wholly agree. I want to see some fresh personalities. And that's what I want to see. And I know he said that kind of the the onus right now is on in ring ability. And I and I get it. You know, for people who think wrestling's all a bunch of a bunch of crap and it's a crock and it's all scripted and yada yada yada, yes, it is scripted. But those guys are world class athletes to be able to do what they do. I mean, to be able to be six five, six seven, two hundred eighty, two hundred ninety pounds, two hundred fifty pounds, to flip around and do the things that they do within within the confines of that ring is absolutely amazing stuff. So I get that, and I tip my cap to that big time. But I'm that guy who I want to see the soap opera. I want the feuds. I want the guys on mic. It's no secret that The Rock was always my favorite guy because when he walked out on a stage, he owned an arena of 16,000 people. And short of Jericho, I don't really see anybody like that in wrestling now. That's what I want to see. That was the biggest reason I wanted to ask him about CM Punk because he was the last guy that I thought could pull that off. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, they've got to get back to a point where the wrestling is part of the storytelling. You know, when you had this feud that would lead up and, and you know, you look at um, some of the, the tables, ladders, and chairs matches. You look at some of the, just the ladders matches, just overall matches. I mean, I was in the arena, Austin versus Rock, when Austin turned corporate. And it's got to be an extension. You know, you go through, you cut the promos, you know, you, you give them some stuff, let those personalities show through, and then let the storytelling continue on through the match itself. And I think that it's it's almost looked at as two events now. Okay, this guy's got a promo, it's gone through, and they've gone through and done the one thing that always drove me nuts about WCW, and that is they interrupt the matches for commercials. Oh, yeah. Oh, that drives yeah. me crazy. Yeah, no, that does suck. Well, you know, I will say this about uh, you know what made it work in the good old days and where where pro wrestling is today. You know, it really you don't get much better pedigree than Rhodes and Jr. And I told uh, Hartness at Liberty Con when I ran into him in Chattanooga this summer, I was like, man, you don't get a better consigliere than Jim Ross. That's a guy that knows how things should go. And the fact that he is kind of behind the scenes counseling all these guys, in addition to the wealth of knowledge that you get from the Rhodes family and the money of Tony Khan, I really want to see Dynamite next Wednesday night. I will be up. I will be watching that. I do want to see what that looks like. So. Yeah, he, he mentioned NXT going up against against that, and I think that's a mistake. I by, don't by care WWE. about NXT. I, the fact yeah. that they even drew a million on cable television for a developmental series – I don't understand how those are poor numbers. I mean, I think AEW is going to smoke that number on TNT. 
and that that's like back, you know, it's like having Ohio Valley Wrestling come through. That's what it feels like. You know, that's yeah. one of their one of their feeder uh, places coming in just to do stories. I I know it's a little different. It's part of their reality TV, whatever they've got going on, and so it's they're they're creating names, but there's just nothing captivating about it to me. Yep. No, I wholly agree. All right, man. Well, we've got some headlines as teased at the top of the show. So what do you say we get into the news? Oh, kick it. And now the news. So it appears there was a disturbance in the force this week. Uh, In his new book titled The Right of a Lifetime, Lessons Learned from 15 Years, as the CEO of Walt Disney Company, uh, Disney CEO Bob Iger revealed that George Lucas wasn't too thrilled when he found out the direction that Disney was going to go with the new Star Wars films. Uh, according to the story, which was published in the Huffington Post, uh, Lucas turned in three outlines for what he believed would become the sequel trilogy to Disney execs whenever they bought Lucasfilm in 2012 for four billion with a B dollars, and uh, they read them over, decided meh, and turned to J.J. Abrams to see what he could got. And when Lucas found out about this, he was, quote, betrayed. That's their word, not mine. But uh, also went on to quote Lucas as saying he thought that uh, TFA, Force Awakens, brought, quote, nothing new to the table. On that, I wholly agree with George Lucas. But in any case, the article's out there. You can go read it. It's also on our Facebook page. You can go check that out. Uh, One other note, and this was not explained in Bob Iger's book, but it was revealed in a James Cameron documentary called The Story of Science Fiction. Uh, Lucas was described as saying that had he done the sequel trilogy, he wanted to go into the microbial end of Star Wars, so your metachlorians. And he wanted to talk about these little micro-whatever beings called the Wills and how they are actually the ones that create or that drive the universe and feed off the Force. That's what Uncle George wanted to do with the sequel trilogy. I got to tell you, well, well, I'll give thoughts on that in just a second. So that's the spiel on Star Wars. Uh, in other news, turning to streaming news, uh, Netflix rolled out a couple of good trailers this week. One was for The Irishman, which is being directed by Martin Scorsese and stars Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, and Joe Pesci. It's about uh, Hitman who was involved, allegedly involved, in the slang of Joe Hoffa. The other trailer, and we've pubbed the crap out of this one, El Camino, starring Aaron Paul and others reprising their roles from the hit AMC series Breaking Bad. Uh, Camino will be the first one to drop that will hit Netflix on October 11th and then the Irishman drops Thanksgiving weekend on November the 27th and then finally the CW is going retro a la the WB for their Crisis on Infinite Earths uh, event coming up this winter it's been rumored forever that somehow there would be a Smallville component to the big five night crossover event and now we know what that's going to be it is in fact going to be stars Tom Welling and Erica Durance both of whom have officially signed on to be a part of the event and they will reprise their roles as Lois and Clark from the Smallville timeline so for those who aren't familiar with what Crisis on Infinite Earths is it was a mega comic book event in the 80s that brought in multiple versions of characters from different universes from the multiverse which is a popular term now in one giant battle to, to save all of creation, essentially. So that's what they're going to be doing here. So Smallville will be treated like one of the universes in the multiverse, which I think is a really cool way to bring these guys back. Uh, it will acknowledge Smallville canon, and it will tell us Uh, what Lois and Clark have been up to in the last eight years since Smallville closed. Um, In related news, Michael Rosenbaum, who played Lex Luthor on Smallville, was approached uh, to reprise his role as well, but he ultimately declined, citing a lack of clarity on shooting schedule, salary, and lack of clarity on what his character's arc was going to look like. So he passed. So anyway, that is your news. We got Star Wars, we've got Netflix, and we have got Smallville slash Crisis on Infinite Earths. Dave, let's go ahead and start with the Star Wars thing. You know, the Bob Iger stuff, it is it is what it is. That's long since been known that Lucas has not been happy with the sequel trilogy. Um, but what I did find kind of fascinating about this was Lucas's thoughts on where he would have gone with the sequel trilogy had he been, you know, had he been in charge. Uh, this whole idea of delving into the microbial end of Star Wars. What are your thoughts on that? Is that something you'd want to see? That sounds like you would be doing a sequel to Lethal Weapon while you talk about the manufacture of the rounds they're using in their gun. Yeah, no, it's... There was so much to not like about the prequels, and I totally don't want to relitigate that here. But the Midiachlorians really was one of the biggest things I hated about the prequel trilogy. I did not need a biological answer as to how the Force works. That was part of the fun of Star Wars, was it had this kind of fantasy element to it, and the Force was heart and center of that. Uh, I, 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 did, I didn't need that explained to me. 
I, I don't need any more on that. I'm perfectly happy to take that as it's the force. It's the will of the force. Nobody knows what that is. It's, you know, call it God, call it spirituality, call it Buddha, call it, you know, Hungry Howie's Pizza. I don't care. Whatever. It was good just the way that it was. So the fact that he wanted to build an entire trilogy off of that, <laughs> yep, kind of glad he sold out on that just as a just as a fan. But, um, you know, I, I obviously have not been thrilled with the direction the new Star Wars movies have taken either. I go into Rise of Skywalker with zero expectations. I hope they can save it. If they do, great. If not, Okay, that's fine, too. There's going to be a happy hour somewhere happening when I walk out of the theater, and it's still going to be awesome. So. You know, that said, though, it's just, the, it's just the trilogy part of it. Solo was an okay movie. I didn't mind it. It was, yeah, it it was, was good. And then and Rogue One was a fantastic movie. Rogue One and Star Wars Rebels are the best things to come out of Disney's acquisition of Lucasfilm. Bar none. Absolutely. It's not even close. So, uh, you know, I'll be interested to see what the Game of Thrones guys do with, uh, with their slice of this pie. A lot of rumors have it that they're going to do the Knights of the Old Republic era, and we've talked about this before on this show. I think that's exactly the direction Star Wars needs to go. Go someplace that we have never seen before and start over, and I think that will make it fresh. You give it a couple of years, three or four years before you put that out. Fans be clamoring for Star Wars again, and you can start over with a fresh slate. That'll be that. Ryan Johnson is apparently still on tap to write a whole trilogy of his own. I give two craps about that, like not even two craps. So, uh, so that's that, uh, Netflix, Irishman and El Camino. I know you're as much of a big breaking bad guy as you were. You enter El Camino with a little bit of trepidation. Why is that? Well, you know, it, the storytelling was so great in there and, you know, you kind of got to make up what happened with Jesse once he left. I'm going to step in. I want to watch it. I want to see what they do with it. I mean, Vince Gilligan's a fantastic storyteller. It's just a movie. Um, so, you know, it's not trying to go through and, and do something constantly, you know, season after season with it. So I, I think that it will be, it will be good. I just, man, I, I hate for anything to ruin what that series was. Yeah, no, I hear you. I, um, I get asked a lot at cons if I'm going to write a follow up to Colonies Lost, which was my kind of homage to Louis L'Amour in space. It's about a U.S. Marshal from, you know, present day North Carolina, who goes off and finds out what happened to the colonists from the lost colony of Roanoke Island. Um, it was truly, it was, it, I love all of my books, but that one really, really does hold a special place in my heart because I always wanted to write something with kind of a Western tinge to it. And that certainly had it. But anyway, people ask me, cause it, it, it did well. It was an Amazon bestseller. Are you going to write another one? And I tell them, you know, I got a lot of other stuff on my plate right now. So that's not a universe I'm heading back to in the very, very near future. But there's, there's also something to be said for just loving the way something ends. And I love the ending to Colonies Lost. To me, it stands on its own as a complete story that has a great beginning, takes you off on a great adventure, and then has a wonderful ending that kind of tugs at the heartstrings. And I say that based off reviews, not because I'm, you know, patting myself on the back. Um, but as the creator of that story, I like the fact that it ended the way that it did. And I got to really have a great story to make me want to go back to that, to want to wanna run the risk of tarnishing that. So I say all that to say, if Vince Gilligan feels like he has a story to tell, then I'm excited for it. I really am because, you know, I, I love Breaking Bad, but I'm also very much on record as saying I love the way Breaking Bad ended. It was a great ending to a five-year story, and I really hope they know what they're doing when they go touch that. Yeah. Uh, as for The Irishman... Uh, that looks like a fantastic film. Right. It's a Scorsese uh, mob flick with Pacino, De Niro, and Pesci. I mean, you, you had go. me at hello. There you go. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, I will be there, bells on, uh, popcorn in front of the TV, uh, telling, the, telling the girlfriend to be quiet. Yeah, well, go ahead and get yourself a, a cooler and, um, and and be ready to, to make a day of it because that's a four-hour epic. Like it is, It's a big boy movie. So you're, you're going to be on the couch for a while for that one. That was, I think, one of the reasons why Scorsese went with Netflix, because they pretty well just said, you want to make a four-hour movie? Make a four-hour movie. You're Martin Frickett Scorsese. We will let you do it if you want. So I, I will have the catheter inserted. I don't know if I need to know that. but <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. We segue from catheters to Smallville, the characters of whom are definitely older but not quite old enough for a catheter. Uh, Tom Welling, Eric Durance, man, you happy to see these guys back on screen again in character as Lois and Clark? I don't know. Uh, you know, towards the end of that series, they did kind of cause the same pain that a catheter would. <laughs> That's a true story right there. <laughs> Speaking you know, of shows it, that should have ended at season five, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, that that's, seems to be the CW's thing. 
uh, you know, but we, um, we haven't seen these guys for a while. Uh, you know, it, it's in small doses. I think that they had really good on-screen chemistry. If it's a small part of the story, you know, I think it's enough to pull some people in. It, it'll pull me in a little bit. I'm interested to see what they're going to do with it. Right. Yeah, I'm, I am too. Um, I checked out on the Arrow years ago. I, I watched Arrow for the first two seasons, and like we've talked about before, they turned him into Batman. Like I get it. There were always parallels between Oliver Queen and Bruce Wayne. That's fine. I get that. But good grief, man. I mean, when you start talking about Ra's al Ghul and, and I mean, they went full bore Batman with him at the end of season two. And then season three just got ridiculous and it went downhill from there. So I checked out on it. Uh, Flash was a lot of fun for a season or two. And then they tried to kind of darken it up a little bit, which they never should have done. Legends of Tomorrow just kind of felt like a Doctor Who ripoff. Uh, Supergirl is Ally McBeal with a cape. Never was an Ally McBeal fan. Now you got Batwoman coming in. I, I couldn't even get through the trailer on that one. So, um, but, but you know, having said all that, uh, I will definitely watch the crossover because, listen, this is an epic, epic comic book story. I mean, the fact that they're even attempting this deserves recognition. The fact that they're trying to do this on screen, I, I will watch it just to see if they can land the plane. But the Smallville thing is a nice touch. I've been going back through Smallville on Hulu, um, tugging at the nostalgia strings, the early seasons with Christopher Reeve. And it, it was, it really was a charming, charming show at its pinnacle. And I think, I think Welling Endurance will, will do a great job when they come back. My only concern uh, with, with the network that's bringing this up is are, are we going to see a network that's going to try and build the Empire State Building with Tinker Toys? When you look at these stories and, and the grandiose that these stories can be, uh, you need some money behind that because the bit players, the second and third fiddle people that are playing these other parts uh, need to be able to tell their part of the story. And if you're not paying somebody with enough quality to do that, then it, it kind of takes everybody out of it. So, all righty. Well, I think that's probably going to bring us on down to the hour. Let's go ahead and hook up some white flag. White flag. White Flag, as everybody knows, is the segment where we basically kind of throw out what's on our radar in the weeks to come. Can be geek stuff, can be sports stuff, can be dude stuff, can be pretty much whatever we want. That's uh, why we call it White Flag. Because White Flag, end of a race, end of the show. You get where I'm going with this. Dave, wave your white flag, sir. I am looking forward to Saturday. And on Saturday, even though my Miami Hurricanes are on a bye week, I am looking forward to the rest and relaxation that's going to come with being in Doak Campbell Stadium and having to work in there during that small crowd. Uh, I, I think they'll probably do better against NC State just because it's a night game and it won't be blazing freaking hot and you're not sitting on a steel bleacher in 90 degrees with sunshine beating on you. So the fact that it's a night game I think will definitely bring bring a few more people out. And there seems to be an uptick in, you know, in appreciation for them after beating a rebuilding Louisville team. So, uh, I, you know, I, I started the season with Schleybach saying, I think this team needed to win eight games. I think the race is now to six. If, if Taggart can get them to six, get back to a bowl, maybe even win the bowl, that's seven wins on the season. That's enough to keep his job. Other than that, <laughs> well, we'll see where we go from there. You but know, I, Urban I want, Meyer does not have a job right now. Nah, you can screw right off with that. I'm not even going to find <laughs> that with a response. I do want to make it clear, though, I want to see Willie Taggart succeed. I don't know if he can. I don't know if he's good enough, frankly. I, I question his ability to evaluate staff. I question his ability to be able to evaluate a roster. I got lots of questions about Willie. I question his ability to be able to manage a game, a game clock. Um, I, I have lots of questions about Willie Taggart. That said, they do seem to be getting better. And he's already proven that he is one heck of a recruiter. To pull in a top ten recruiting class after a five and seven season is is a feat of epic proportions, and he's done that. So, uh, so we'll see. Well, Ian, with your white flag, what are you looking forward to? I will look forward to seeing if Florida State falls on their face versus <laughs> NC State on Saturday night. <laughs> really hoping that's not the case. I'm never surprised anymore when it is. So, uh, so we'll we'll see. Hopefully, you don't get boat raced by a very very bad NC State team. But uh, also looking forward to the NASCAR playoffs. A uh, big thing I am looking forward to, though, will actually come next week in the forms of AEW Dynamite on TNT, as we've well discussed now. And finally, we get Joker. And lots of press about that. I know people are worried about 
you know, that could bring out the worst in people and there could be bad stuff happening. I think it's sad that we have to have those kinds of stories, but at the end of the day, it's still just a movie and I, for one, absolutely cannot wait to see where this is going. So that will be that. I do want to mention, and this is not a white flag thing because it already happened, but um, today my Cincinnati Reds said goodbye to one of the broadcasting greats in Major League Baseball history, and that was Marty Brenneman, retired after 46 years behind the mic. This is a guy that called games for the Big Red Machine, three World Series in 75, 76, and 90. He called Pete Rose uh, when he became the all-time hits leader, taking it from Cobb. This is a guy with a ton, a ton, a ton of history, one of the great voices, one of the great personalities of the game, and uh, finally decided that uh, that it was time to go. So he retired today. Today was his last call. I caught most of the game on uh, on the at-bat app and then listened to his uh, post-game press conference when he – you know, thank the fans and cried and everybody in the booth got teary eyed and it was a, was a great moment. So I love listening to that guy on the radio. We're going to miss him on game days next year in 2020, but uh, Marty Brenneman folks, absolutely fantastic. And um, I love those guys. So, all right, that is going to do it for episode nine of the dudes in hyperspace podcast. Thank you again to Raj Geary of wrestling Inc.com for coming on the show, talking a little wrestling with us, go check out his website, follow him on social media, subscribe to the stuff. Lots of great content over there for you fans of the ring. As for us, we too are on the web. You can find us at dudesinhyperspace.com, also on Facebook and Twitter at the Hyper Dudes. Shoot us emails, shoot us tweets, dudesinhyperspace at gmail.com. Uh, hashtag dude mail. Good Lord, we're everywhere. So just come find us. The one thing we do ask, though, is if you find us and you like us, you leave the five star reviews on Apple Music, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever podcasts are subscribed. If they will let you leave stars and blurbs, we would kindly appreciate said stars and blurbs. So thank you very much for that. Thank you again to Dave Daniels for tagging along. Scott, feel better. Enjoy that crap show, The Good Place. And we will see you guys next time on the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. See ya. See ya.